Yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Talal Mewdad, a consultant geologist and geologist, and the president of the MSSM, Middle East Society of Sexual Medicine. And uh, I would like to thank you all for the attendance and joining us in our joint webinar with the uh, South Asian Sexual Medicine Society. Uh, the scientific program was really uh, put in a very high caliber uh, presentations and lectures. We have distinguished uh, speakers. We have very excellent uh, moderators for this uh, webinar. And uh, I would like just to uh, wish you all the best uh, watching and uh, learning from this webinar. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Vasan. I'm the president of South Asian Society for Sexual Medicine. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the Middle Eastern Society for this collaborative effort, and specifically Dr. Talal Mardad, uh, who is the president of the society, and uh, also my good friend Amir Meligi, who has taken a lot of pains, who is the founder president and the scientific chairman. And I would like to thank uh, my colleagues uh, in SASM, my, the executive committee, as well as um, um, Shamshul, who is the upcoming president of SASM, and Dr. Gajanan Bhatt and Naresh, Natesh Prabhu, who have put in a lot of effort in um, you know, uh, selecting the topics, identifying the speakers, corresponding with them. I think this, was, uh, uh, this is a webinar which has been planned uh, in such a way that we discuss some of the social cultural issues which we face, which is peculiar to us in this subcontinent. And uh, since there were a lot of cultural similarities between uh, uh, us and the Middle Eastern society, we thought we should have this joint webinar. And uh, like Professor Mardad just now mentioned, we have got an esteemed uh, array of speakers, both from the Middle Eastern society as well as from the South Asian society who are experts in this field and who will throw light on some of the peculiar problems what we have. And we have excellent moderators uh, who will uh, also uh, share their insights into this program. I'm sure it is going to be an academic feast and uh, I welcome one and all. And I sure hope that we will continue this kind of a collaboration uh, with the Middle Eastern Society uh, because uh, we are very close to each other and we have the same type of practices and I warmly welcome all of you and hope you have an enjoyable webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for an uh, elaborate introduction, both uh, Dr. Uh, Talal Mardad as well as uh, Dr. Vasan, sir. Thank you very much for providing an opportunity to moderate this particular uh, webinar. And without wasting much time, let me just invite uh, Dr. Vineet Malhotra, who, has, who is a clinical director and founder of Geos Hospital New Delhi. And uh, he, he is a uroandrologist basically, and he is expertized in uh, penile processes surgeries. And uh, he is going to talk about masturbatory guilt, length and girth issues. Over to you, Dr. Vineet. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Janan, and uh, I will just uh, share my screen and then start this. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity, uh, both uh, Middle East Society of Sexual Medicine and SASM, Dr. Vasan, Dr. Radak, for this opportunity to talk today on, on a unique topic, I would say, because this is something that we face every day, but still find it challenging to deal with. So we will talk about masturbation, guilt, penile length and girth issues. And, and, and I'll give a little bit of my point of view of how I manage these patients. We know masturbation guilt is extremely common. This is because of strong religious beliefs in our region. Uh, there's a lot of conservative upbringing. And, and all said and done, we find this to be something which affects young men uh, fairly prevalent and and we know the religious indoctrination of these patients is 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 across the board whether we look at christianity islam hinduism or other religions it's considered to be a a, 
uh, pleasurable sens uh, sensation which is because of satanic temptations and an immoral by all all religions so the upbringing uh, for all including our indian culture which says the concept of brahmacharya and self control considered semen to be an elixir of life conservation of semen for good health it's considered that if you lose semen you lose some part of your blood and only heterosexual intercourse is something which is permitted so if you look at all the impressions that have come in uh, from a religious and upbringing point of view it they all point towards masturbation being unhealthy now unfortunately early science also gave the same impression and and someone as as you know sigmund freud uh, said that masturbation contributes to hysteria and neuroanesthesia and and sex was considered to be a, <coughs> a threat to health and sanity so even the early scientific impressions actually pointed towards the same as we see these men they come in with guilt anxiety depression psychosis deviant sexual behaviors even erectile dysfunction premature ejaculation they have libido and arousal disorders and and we'll be having a talk on dhat syndrome and a lot of these may coexist with men coming in with uh, symptoms suggestive of dhat syndrome also having a severe masturbation guilt presenting with erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation um essentially you have contradictory evidence you have some evidence which shows that excessive masturbation may be associated with depressive illnesses impaired sexual function unstable mental health and either in increased or reduced risk of prostate cancer so you have very contradictory evidence um the evidence to link masturbation with uh, either detrimental or beneficial effects actually is very poor in terms of its evidence there's no treatment as such for this so you would look at counseling and treating symptoms which require to be handled uh, most importantly it should come across to the man that this is a healthy practice it is not immoral it is not something which is associated with disease and and does not have detrimental effects to the physical outcome of his body health or otherwise and then you would treat these symptoms appropriately most of these men may present with some varying form of sexual dysfunction and that would be treated appropriately whether it's pd5s for erectile dysfunction or ssris for the premature ejaculation now we'll come to the other topic which is also another one which uh, a lot of men have concern about especially if we look at the asian region a lot of men will come with concern about their penile size length and girth as it actually matter now the average penile length is actually 13.1 cm and the girth is 11.65 cm whereas men believe the average length to be much longer as almost as much as 15 and a half centimeters and uh, this is something which is uh, called the penile dysmorphophobic disorder which is essentially a preoccupation with a minor or non existent flaw in the body image and that can cause marked impairment in various areas of functioning now most importantly these men can be again severely preoccupied with their size being particularly small having particular guilt and shame factors associated with it whereas the true micro penis is defined as a flaccid penile length of less than 4 cm and an erect penile length of less than 7.5 cm we'll we'll see that in spite of this a lot of men with normal sized penises will actually present to us with shame embarrassment guilt they become social recluses they're depressed they have erectile dysfunction libido and arousal disorders and a lot and lot of men will compare their penile sizes and believe them to be smaller relative to other men this is an extremely common presentation also the male ego you know penile size is equated with sexual competence and masculinity it has nothing to do with either of these but it is equated with these unfortunately one of the drawbacks is the actual penile length assessment it's very variable it's very subjective so if you're going to look at flaccid penile length and if this is measured at home by the patient it's very inaccurate if it's stretched penile length measured in the clinic 
it is subjective with a significant variation between observers and somewhat accurate is the erect penile length measurement so uh, there have been various studies which have erred or differed in their uh, estimation of penile length and which is why the data which is assessed can be very difficult to actually compare because you have different tools of measuring the penile length does it matter to women actually it doesn't uh, there's been studies which have shown that there's no importance that women give to the penile length and only 20% of women considered the penile length to be important that to the visual penile length not actually in the sexual act in spite of that we have an array of penile enhancement procedures and and we'll talk about these penile enhancement procedures so you can talk about girth enhancements procedures and length en enhancement procedures so girth ones increase both flaccid and erect penile circumference while maintaining a natural looking shaft and normal sensory function uh, essentially procedures would include uh, interventions which could be hormonal interventions in form of testosterone formulations oral medications vacuum erection devices have not shown to change girth or length in in any format and traction devices have been more popularly used there are several forms of injection therapies including recent use of prp therapies and and soft tissue fillers have been extremely popular including the polylactic acid fillers and the hyaluronic acid fillers there's this paper which has been recently published most of there's a lot of data which comes out of south korea because there's a lot of work that has been done on penile enhancement procedures that come in from south korea this is a comparison of clinical outcomes between hyaluronic acid and polylactic acid fillers this is actually a an rct which has shown significant improvement at follow up of 18 months and you have such papers Un unfortunately I'll, i'll come to some data later on but so you have traction devices also which have been used again they've been in place for about more than almost uh, a decade and a half now uh, the initial early ones required long hours of application almost 9 to 10 hours of application they were cumbersome and all of them resulted in an average length increase of about 1 to 1 and 1/2 cm you have recent ones where you require much shorter duration of Uh, stretch or traction and the restrix device uh, for which dr landon trust will has presented uh, a lot of work uh, especially for men that have shortening or scarring with peronies or prior surgical procedures you see you see better outcomes not so much as where you have a normal sized penis which has not had any reason for scarring or shortening and then you have surgical options such as graft and flap procedures subcutaneous implants corporoplastic phalloplasties so porcine dermal fat grafts cis grafts ovine perigardium all have been used and there's been a lot and lot of complication especially if you've used subcutaneous implants they've all been removed in a study that was done a lot of other disabling shortenings curvatures edemas infections non healing wounds in fact one of them ended up with an orchiectomy so you have significant complications that have resulted from these procedures whether you've injected put in grafts or done subcutaneous implants so so the evidence for all of these penile girth strategies are poor so it's important to understand that psychological distress sexual function quality of life concerns should be taken into mind with any treatment approach and you must use oral medications before you consider invasive procedures counseling is the mainstay and works for a significant percentage of men coming to penile lengthening procedures so uh, again most men seeking lengthening surgeries actually have a normal sized penis again we talk about pdd and and these uh, lengthening procedures essentially involve some of these steps you either divide ligament and release it the periosteal fixation of the cavernosal bodies is also released and you can interpose some graft there a viva skin plasty is done to again release and advance the penile shaft and at the end of the procedure you result you do a post procedure traction using one of the traction devices so this is how the viva plasty will look like and and you'll end up also releasing the uh, cavernosal bodies from the bone and advance the penile shaft and put in a graft 
in here. A, a, a very drastic procedure is the penal disassembly procedure or the corporal disassembly procedure. Uh, it can have catastrophic outcomes. So again, a procedure which is performed, but must be very wary about these kind of procedures for penal lengthening. The reported length gain could be as little as one to two centimeters, sometimes greater. The girth increase of one to two and a half centimeters. Adverse outcomes are extremely common. Unfortunately, these are all very poorly uh, performed studies. So the outcomes have not been reported with great accuracy. And you may have penile deformities, shortening, scarring, granuloma formations. Again, erectile dysfunction. So some of these men actually come in later on with even shorter penises than they started off with. A systematic review of surgical and non-surgical interventions in Normal men complaining of penile size. This is also a recent uh, paper, and they've concluded that uh, it's this this kind of treatment is supported by very very low quality evidence, and so should remain a last option considered unethical outside of clinical trials. So uh, you know this is something that we must remember as a bottom line that if we are Attempting to use penile enhancement procedures, they must be as part of clinical trials. The AUA guideline position is that stretch penile length must be less than 7.5 centimeters to be considered for elongation surgery. Sex education and psychological counseling is suggested. The AUA UCF statement uh, again uh, considers subcutaneous fat injection for increasing girth to be a procedure which has not shown to be safe and efficacious. Also con considers the division of suspensory ligament of the penis for increasing penile length to be a procedure which is not shown to be safe or efficacious. Penile and scrotal enhancement surgery can be associated with significant disabling complications leading to deformity and functional compromise in men with prior normal anatomy and function. So, so what is my point of view? is it is unwarranted in men with normal penile dimensions and conservative means should be considered for these men. I, I on, a, on a personal note, do not do penile uh, girth or length enhancement procedures for men with who fall within the normal penile dimensions. They are not recommendations also based on current guidelines and, and we should limit these to either men who have suffered scarring or shortening due to previous complications or com surgical procedures or have true anatomical abnormal penile dimensions. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Vinit, for a very sharp to the point talk and also for uh, keeping well in time. And uh, we shall keep the questions at the end. And uh, please uh, watch our uh, group for the messages, the WhatsApp group for the messages for questions. And we'll go over to next presenter, Dr. Bishurul Hafi, who is a dermatologist from Kerala. He is a secretary elect of Psychodermatology Association of India, and his research interest is female Dath syndrome. Dath syndrome. Over to you, Dr. Bishurul Hafi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bird, for your nice uh, introduction. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is uh, Dr. Vishwadafi. I'm basically a dermatologist, but uh, uh, interested in uh, sexual medicine practice. My uh, topic today is Dove Syndrome, when culture kills pleasure. Uh, many of you might know well about that syndrome, uh, but uh, I want to give a comprehensive uh, uh, coverage about this. Uh, condition. Uh, uh, culture and religion have immense influence in designing a person's thoughts and actions. As a matter of fact, South, Southeast in Asia, especially India, is a region where most vibrant ancient cultures existed. Its legendary contribution, Kama Sutra, written by Vatsyayana Maharshi, revolutionized the worldview about human sexuality. Even in this most sacred places of worship, they are filled with the most beautiful temple art sculptures detailing sexuality as a whole. But somewhere, somehow, society lost the plot and they started treating sex 
as one's enemy in reaching perfection as a uh, uh, previous uh, uh, speaker told about brahmacharya and all it led to some special medical situation most commonly dart syndrome as we know it now the term dart was derived from sanskrit word dhatu which means metal or elixir or constituent part of human body semen is perceived as the most precious essential body element in vedic literature it is widely believed that semen is formed from the consumed food by a series of steps of ultra condensation in the body which uh, looks like very complex procedure the prevailing dictum is it takes 40 drops of food and 40 days of 40 days to form one, one drop of blood 40 drops of blood to form one drop of marrow and 40 drops of marrow to form one drop of semen so you you might uh, imagine how complicated uh, the production of semen in that uh, concept is so what exactly is that syndrome is it a anxiety or a delusion neurosis or obsession in thoughts what is it basically it is culture bound syndrome what is that as per dsm for uh, definition they do not culture bound syndrome as recurrent locality specific patterns of aberrant behavior and troubling experience that may or may not be linked to a particular dsm for diagnostic category confused so a culture specific syndrome is characterized by the following uh, this five criteria one is categorization as a disease in that culture not a voluntary behavior or false claim widespread familiarity in that culture complete lack of familiarity or misunderstanding of the condition to people in other culture no objective demonstrable biochemical or any other tissue science the condition is usually recognized and treated by folk medicine of the culture uh, probably quacks or whatever uh, so most important question which all cultures uh have, are affected with that syndrome uh, we might think that it's basically a disease of eastern culture especially india and all but uh, wherever where the uh, pe- where people uh, thought semen as very precious they might have uh, they might have uh, that syndrome at that point of time while we uh, th- uh, look about uh, western culture even hippocrates thought semen supplies the form to the human body aristotle uh, he thought semen is the most perfect component of our blood galen thought losing sperm cause amount to losing vital spirits even celsus told semen loss cause death due to consumption even in 19th century uh, this doctor uh, called dr m tissot uh, this is this is a pamphlet written by him diseases caused by masturbation which was very popular among catholic communities of western uh, that time he told that losing 1 ounce of semen, semen more debilitating than losing 40 ounces of blood because of this his uh, uh, work uh, so many anti masturbation devices and all got uh, you know uh, they got into the market even freud as the previous speaker told he uh, wrote that frequency of masturbation parallel to male neurasthenia even in lancet editorial there was uh, one uh, edition about physical mental impairment and moral degeneration by semen loss in 1840s so at that point of time even in western culture that syndrome might have existed but in uh, current world mainly uh, that syndrome is uh, geographically distributed in china where they call shen pui in sri lanka where they call prameha other parts of southeast asia where they call jiria malayo indonesia they call latha and in japan they call timu there are anecdotal reports even from europe us russia oman pakistan bangladesh and all so one question is there uh, uh, religion is the cause uh religion can contribute to that but not exactly is the cause because uh, it transcend religion in india major religion is hindu uh, and hinduism then in uh, bangladesh pakistan major religion is uh, islam in uh, uh, sri lanka it is buddhism so basically it is culture not religion so is it really an exotic culture bound syndrome or rather a common culture reactive condition do many people uh, think that it is not very rare but just a common culture reactive condition they tell that these uh, people who are affected with uh, that syndrome they can be influenced by other factors such as personality traits peer and family support available to the individual and alternative expression of experience so how to diagnose that syndrome sadly there is no clear and common definition uh, in icd 10 it is uh, 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 categorized under the diagnostic category as other non psychiatric mental disorders 
under dsm4 it mentions in the appendix section and dsm5 under the section of culture concepts of distress but in all this definition um, at the uh, you know core point is uh, there is a preoccupation of the patient with the loss of that from the body and the belief that this loss results in significant harm to physical mental or sexual well-being and uh, 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 dr sandeep grover lecture he made a beautiful comprehensive validated questionnaire to make a diagnosis but current nosology has so many issues because different doctors tend to diagnose it in different ways so it is very difficult to get an exact prevalence of that syndrome a recent study revealed that during a follow up study of more than 6 years only one third of the patients retain their diagnosis of that syndrome and some others advocate that that syndrome can be a part of depressive spectrum disorders with different cultural expression and some uh, tell that it it can be a somatoform disorders uh, with the cultural specific manifestation and you know uh, people with that syndrome they go to ayurveda homeo and whatever and there is a gross disparity in the understanding and conceptualization of that syndrome in modern system and alternative system of medicine so this disparity also confuses the patients as they visit multiple healthcare providers so major question what is a dat is it semen or any white discharges or a type of phosphaturia or just discharge of pus urine or sugar actually various studies give different account but my take is is that can be anything which is coming through urethra which make patient think that he is losing something very precious is the, uh, that that is simple uh, you know uh, definition and so what are the clinical presentations uh, mostly patients might be young males rural background poor education level but i am seeing many patients from uh, you know opposite uh, demographics age of onset second to uh, third decades of life uh, that's true and often times uh, they have a uh, very uh, you know uh, peculiar belief system that their whatever symptoms they have they attribute it to semen loss or loss of semen like substances and the uh, this dark can go through night for i mean nocturnal emission or even through while uh, while defecation and uh, you know uh, they tell that i have uh, many erotic dreams and excessive sexual desire that is causing this problem and most common symptoms are weakness of the body tiredness low energy and low mood and actually this clinical manifestation of that syndrome it can be broadly classified into these four headings affective symptoms like low mood anxiety worry etc somatic symptoms like body ache lethargy etc behavioral symptoms like withdrawn behavior loss of libido etc cognitive symptoms like pessimistic view about future etc and they demonstrate abnormal illness behavior even hypochondriasis and emotional distress they are significantly higher among them and it is reported that that syndrome can be a prodromal phase of schizophrenia so uh, one important uh, point like that syndrome is it uh, does that exist among females actually it is very rarely discussed you know uh, female but there are females from southeast asia and even in india they attribute uh, the symptoms of male that syndrome to vaginal discharge actually they are perceiving physiological vaginal discharge pathologically but you know current uh, diagnosis system uh, they don't it, it, it doesn't include uh, female that syndrome uh, so it often get diagnosed as other psychiatric, psychiatric disorders there are many comorbidities uh, to this uh, patients with dart syndrome Ma- mainly psychiatric comorbidities uh, one or another and most of the more than half 50% they will have some kind of sexual dysfunctions and most common dysfunctions are premature ejaculation and uh, erectile dysfunction one fifth of patients had uh, comorbid depression and another one fifth had comorbid stress and neurotic disorders some studies report depression is the most common comorbid condition in that syndrome and patient of that syndrome with comorbid depression have more features of hypochondriasis and high somatosensory amplification than those having that syndrome without comorbidity and the patient with that syndrome they score high for neuroticism some facts evidence from north india reported that a person with dart syndrome spend more than 6 years with the illness before reporting to a mental health professional majority of patients with dart syndrome first consult a non qualified doctor or an ayurvedic practitioner for the treatment mean duration of the patient with dart syndrome to seek a professional help for the first time is more than 2 years and the same 
uh, with a mental health professional is more than five years. Patient with Down syndrome follow a long pathway of care and visit three to four practitioners before reaching to a psychiatrist. So what is the management? There was a question in chat section about the management of that syndrome. I'm uh, telling now itself. Uh, you know, we need a comprehensive assessment, Grover's questionnaire. So uh, the assessment should, uh, you know, include a psychiatrist and psychologist. Patient expect actually NFJC medication, tonics, vitamins and injections and blah, blah. So we might have to give some principles like nutraceuticals or something. But, you know, mainstay of treatment is non-pharmacological. Basically, uh, Salam et al. from India, he had, they had uh, developed a cognitive behavior therapy intervention module for the management of that syndrome. It comprised of imparting sex education, resolving sexual mix, uh, correcting cognitive errors, imaginal exposures with desensitization, as well as homework assignment in the form of masturbatory training. Patients with comorbid sexual dysfunction were trained in giggles exercise, squeeze technique, start, stop techniques, which you all know. Sessions are structured as briefs lasting for 45 minutes and range from 11 to 16 sessions. And there are many models in patient management like such Sociosomatic explanatory model, integrated approach, person-centered management model. I'm not going into the details. Then what about pharmacological treatment? Um, there are reports that SSRIs are um, useful along with counseling in the management of that syndrome and comorbid depression. Since depression and anxiety disorders are common comorbidities with that syndrome, antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications are commonly found to be useful in that syndrome. But alas, what is the outcome of this management? Grover et al. in their study, they found dropout rate to be more than 50% at the end of six months. And, you know, those who completed the treatment, actually they, uh, they had uh, uh, psychiatric consultation voluntarily and they had better knowledge about illness with positive attitude toward sex. But, you know, more than 45% of those who completed the treatment uh, they uh, reported no improvements and you know there uh, there is uh, there was a follow-up study uh, in which uh, uh, patients with Down syndrome uh, uh, found that more, nearly one-fifth of the patients initial diagnosed with Down syndrome remains still symptomatic due to incomplete remission and nearly two-thirds initially diagnosed with Down syndrome qualify for other uh, diagnostic categories uh, most commonly somatoform disorders so my conclusion is that syndrome is a culture bond or culture reactive syndrome which transcend region, religion, <laughs> and ethnicity. Intervention in cultures and public perception is essential in the fight against that syndrome. Sexual myths should be broken with scientific facts and positive sex education, but not abstinence based. Should be given to a larger population at younger age and importance of pleasure in human sexuality must be reinforced. These are my references. Thank you all. Dr. Bishnu Hafi, you thank you very much for a comprehensive coverage of Dark syndrome. And that also in a record time. Now, thank you very much. And uh, I hand over uh, the stage to Dr. Muhammad Shamsul Hassan for uh, moderating the session on unconsummated marriages. Good evening, all. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Gazanan Pat. And thanks uh, to the organizer of MESSM and uh, SASM for inviting me. Uh, uh, the next presenter is Dr. Paula Shroy. He is the psychiatrist who has graduated from SILET. Uh, and he also uh, did his master's uh, from SILET uh, Medical College, uh, known as Osmania Medical College. And he has completed his uh, fellow of the European Committee of Sexual Medicine. We call it FECSM in 2020. And he will be presenting on unconsummated marriage. It's up to you, uh, Dr. Paula Shroy.
Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for the introduction, Dr. Maksud, and welcome to everybody to my topic on unconsummation, unconsummated marriage. And uh, before going to the main topic, first of all, I want to tell something about uh, consummation. Actually, in general uh, uh, sense, we can mean uh, the consummation as the point at which something is complete or finalized. And if we define uh, consummation or relationship ground, it can be described as the action of marriage or relationship, uh, which is uh, completed by having sexual intercourse. Uh, in many tradition uh, and in, in civil or religious law, uh, the consummation of marriage is the first or first officially candidated act of sexual intercourse between the two people and um, uh, uh, following uh, their marriage uh, to each other or, uh, or a short or prolonged uh, romantic or sexual relation attraction. And the definition is con of consummation usually refers to penile vaginal, uh, uh, penile vaginal uh, penetration actually. And uh, as the backbone of society, uh, ma ma marriage is considered to be one of the most important uh, institution in the world and, and in most societies, be it in the east or west, most people marry at uh, some stage during their life. And there are a variety of motives behind their marriage that includes uh, uh, the need for friendship or social or emotional support, love and sex, etc. And different peoples belonging in different ethnicity and culture uh, and also economic standard has, uh, has different view regarding the wedding night rituals actually. And some of them think that the marriage regulated the sex and wedding night fulfilled the ritual of permitting the sex. And on the other hand, uh, some group of people think actually marriage served to integrate couples uh, into an integrated system of community ties and uh, uh, obligations. And it was uh, primarily based on economic and political rather than any romance, actually. Now, so the unconsummated marriage can be defined as a, uh, the, uh, as the failure to perform successful sexual intercourse at the beginning of the marriage. And it usually occurs in the first few nights of marriage. And so that it, it is frequently uh, uh, referred to as honeymoon importance or wedding night importance. Though uh, uh, these topics was not vastly studied previously, but uh, different studies in different areas, societies of the world, across the world, uh, report its prevalence about 7% to 63.9% in uh, 9%. And, and it is surprisingly uh, observed that the main reasons for this disorder are similar in different countries. And uh, the unconsummated marriage seems to be very common in the conservative Middle Eastern societies and in the developing countries where the couples are strongly prevented by religious and cultural taboos from the sexual experiences uh, before the marriage. If we explore the impact of unconsummation of marriage on couples' life, I can say that it can be devastating. As we know that the unconsummation of marriage is a disorder of sexual function that impacts couples across the across a wide variety of functionality. When the excitement of uh, marriage and the anticipation of sexual intimacy are met with failed attempts at consummation, frustration, shame, and feeling of inadequacy can catapult uh, clients into a lost uh, of other sex in, uh, into a host of other sexual uh, dysfunction and unconsummation can have harmful effects on the physiology of, uh, of psychology of individual uh, partners. It can lead to low self-esteem in individuals. Blame games can result in frequent fights among the partners and extramarital affairs, fights within the family or both, both the families. And uh, uh, if, if there is no help, actually, if appropriate help is not available there, then it may lead to annulment of marriage. And, and last of all, the divorce will be the last, last resource. We know that normal sexual function requires the involvement of coordination and multiple uh, regulatory systems uh, and is thus subject to the influence of psychological, um, hormonal and uh, neurological and vascular factors. And interactions in any of these factors may be sufficient to cause unconsummation.
if we go through the psychological factor to explore the psychological factor uh, in a developing country like bangladesh or india most individuals individuals have nil or inadequate knowledge about sex we know that so many individuals feel difficulties to have sex after marriage and based on the early techniques based on the early teachings actually by their family or, or, or religion some may have a negative uh, image about sex and um, uh, that is why they fail to understand the importance of sex in postmarital relationship and also they can they cannot realize that sex is an integral part of marriage as a result they, they may not uh, indulge uh, in and uh, and nor um, allow the partner to proceed for some people the only way they can get this information from the internet and mostly from the unreliable pornographic sites which often end up confusing the couple even more the intense social pressure to perform the coitus with an uh, unfamiliar uh, woman and um, and in the in the presence of relatives waiting nearby the uh, near, nearby for evidence of the, the bride virginity and confirmation of coitus may greater may generate some anxiety and while performing the sexual act and ultimately unsuccessful attempts happens other sources of performance anxiety uh, regarding the uh, unconsummation which which cause the unconsummation un unconsummation include the uh, fear of sexual fa failure uh, sexual myths about uh, sexual performance fear of being rejected by the partner lack of privacy and uh, sometimes misconception and beliefs about the sexuality If we go, go if, we, if we find the, what are the organic cause of uh, unconsummation, and uh, we know that sexual dysfunction, like erectile dysfunction in in, in premature ejaculation in in male and uh, vaginismus in females, has been the predominantly reported as cause of uh, unconsummation marriage and uh, vulvodynia uh, and often uh, unbearable pain when the genital are genitals are touched is is also one possible region of unconsummation. If we go for uh, management of, uh, of, uh, of unconsummation and uh, uh, to manage this case, actually, uh, uh, we know that several cases after well, after a lot of waiting, sometimes uh, even as long as a decade uh, or more after tried black magic or having failed uh, surgeries like hymenectomy, fentanyloplasty, this this part these couples are seeking help. So, Actually, often the diagnosis is missed by sometimes uh, doctors and the dismissive attitude of the medical professionals also is responsible for couples suffering for long. To find the actual cause of unconsummation, an empathetic attitude by the doctor is required and, and so that patient know that they are not being judged as incompetent person. And all, it is also essential to assess, the, assess, assess and evaluate uh, both the partners and their sexual history along with their current relationship and psychiatric history well in combination with the physical examination and diagnostic testing. Where are some non-pharmacological uh, approaches actually for treating the uh, unconsummation of my unconsummated marriage? As we know that the, 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 the most of the cause that generate the unconsummation are the psychological. And uh, regarding psychological management, the premarital period is one of the critical points for the evaluation for the prevention of serious relationship problems. In many developed countries like England, um, uh, US, United States, couples are encouraged to practicing uh, participate in uh, premarital counseling programs and found this can increase uh, the marital satisfaction actually. Uh, premarital, premarital sex education can also be prevented the uh, unconsummation of marriage, unconsummated marriage arising due to wrong or inadequate knowledge uh, um, of sex. And uh, couple counseling uh, on sex and physical relationship, including uh, sex education, can be available after marriage. As we know, the sexual behavior is a learned behavior in humans with guided practice and careful calibrated exercise a person can develop. Uh, greater skill and confidence and can overcome troubling sexual symptoms. Educating a couple uh, to, to take their time, experience sexuality and intimacy, and rather than uh, view it as a performance or a test, often takes the pressure off and improve the anxiety-related symptoms. Marital therapy is done to resolve the interpersonal issues, actually, by helping the couple to improve uh, understanding about their uh, faulty behavior, develop trust, and emotional bonding and to spend quality time together and that will eventually save the relationship. 
and the behavior ther therapy where the first couple should be encouraged to explore their own sexuality by performing mutual masturbation and using sexual toys such as vibrators and liquid paraffin. Once they are comfortable uh, with their own sexuality, uh, gradually they can uh, progress to having uh, intercourse. If we found that the actual cause of unconsumation is due to any sexual disorder, we have to manage this condition accordingly. And if this case is vaginismus, and we know that vaginismus is believed to be a psycho uh, physiological disorder uh, due to fear from actual or imagined negative experiences with penetration uh, and or organic um, uh, pathology. Women with vaginismus have also been noted that uh, they, they, they may have a lack of sex education. And to treat the vaginismus, we need multidisciplinary approach. Sometimes medication like analgesics, anxiolytics, uh, or antidepressants are used for symptomatic um, um, relief and uh, along with the physical therapy like Kegel's therapy, Kegel's exercise and uh, behavioral therapy and relationship therapy. Sexual desire is considered the result of complex balance uh, between the inhibitory and excitatory pathway. We know that in the brain. And here dopamine, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone play an excitatory role, whereas the uh, prolactin uh, and serotonin are inhibitory. Thus, decrease in the sexual desire could be due to reduced level of excitatory stimulation or increased level of uh, inhibitory stimulation or both. Uh, with the previous effective methods uh, to treat the hyperactive sexual desire disorder in female, um, some there are some uh, few established pharmacologic treatments nowadays uh, that are present for treating the hyperactive sexual desire disorder. And fibonsarin was the first drug approved for the treatment of HSGD by USFDA. And, uh, Bremelanotide, a model uh, no, novel melanocortin uh, receptor agonist, was recently approved by FDA for the treatment of acquired or generalized HSDD in premenopausal women. The exact cause of premature ejaculation is not known. Uh, previously, it was thought that uh, it can be only psychological. But nowadays, it is proved that premature ejaculation uh, involves a complex interaction of psychological and biological factors. And uh, we can use, uh, to treat the premature ejaculation, we can use pause, squeeze, or stop start technique uh, first, that very fast, and which can help delay ejaculation. And uh, if it fails, some tropical anesthetic creams and sprays that contains a numbing agent such as benzocaine, lidocaine, or, or, or um, prilocaine uh, are sometimes used to treat the condition. Many oral medication might delay the orgasm. And uh, although none of these uh, actually uh, nowadays it is not specifically approved by USFDA for treating the premature ejaculation, though some medication, including the antidepressant, that is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor or some analgesics like uh, tramadol or uh, PD-5 PD inhibitor can be used to treat the premature ejaculation. And uh, last of all, the erectile dysfunction is the uh, inability to get, we know that it is the, it, it is the condition of inability to get the keep, get and keep, the, keep an erection firm enough for sex. If erectile dysfunction persists, it can cause stress affect one's self-confidence and contribute uh, the contribute for the relationship problem. If erectile dysfunction is caused by stress, anxiety, and depression, or the condition is creating uh, stress and relationship tension, psychological measures should be taken first. We have to know that. And some people uh, have, have erectile dysfunction that might be complicated by uh, low levels of the of testosterone. And in this case, testosterone replacement therapy might be uh, recommended alone or given in combination with other therapies. Oral medication like PD5 inhibitor have proven benefit on erectile dysfunction uh, uh, treatment. And other medication like self injection of uh, prostaglandin E wall, that is uh, uh, alprostadil, papaverine, or penfentolamine, can be used alone or in combination uh, on the or, or, or in combination actually. And alprostadil can be used as a suppository form in uh, it, it can be a way actually. And if all the medication uh, are not effective or appropriate, then the vacuum erection device can be used. And when all the methods are uh, found fail, then implant 
can be the last resource for treating the uh, erectile dysfunction. So I think uh, 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 this, this this was my uh, talk about some some talk about uh, unconsummated un marriage and thank you all for for your further hearing. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. Sir. Thank you, Paula, sir, for your nice presentation. And that's all for from Sasam presentation. Uh, two from India and one from Bangladesh. Now I would like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Amir Al Melegi, if I if I spell it wrong, uh, sorry for for that, uh, to uh, be the moderator of next sessions. There are three presentations, and uh, it will be. Uh, Moderated by Dr. Amir Al Melegi. Off to you, Dr. Amir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Amir Melegi. I'm uh, the founder of the Middle East Society for Sexual Medicine, and currently I'm the chairman of the scientific committee, which gave me the privilege in order to organize this wonderful session together with the SASM Society. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers because really very nice lectures, which uh, uh, I, I don't see them in India or in Sri Lanka or some, I see them in Egypt and in Saudi Arabia and in all the Middle East. These uh, were speaking about masturbatory guilt or unconsummated marriage or uh, uh, lots of other topics which have been spoken about. Uh, let me introduce now uh, Dr. Islam Fathi, who is an associate professor of andrology, sexology, and sexually transmitted diseases in Cairo University, Egypt. He will sp be speaking about uh, uh, one of the cases which we see a lot in our clinics, and it's really one of the uh, cases which we don't like to see because it's very challenging. It is really not easy to manage. This is when uh, a male comes to you who is a single, naive, sexually naive, and is complaining of erectile dysfunction and how to deal with it. Dr. Islam Fatri, please. I uh, thanks, Dr. Amr. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, at uh, at first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Amr Ligi uh, uh, and the uh, uh, South Asian Society of Sexual Medicine. And today, I am going to uh, talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, challenging cases uh, that we meet in our uh, uh, clinics um, regularly. Uh, it is the management of erectile dysfunction in single sexually naive uh, males. Uh, we have a problem in defining in su a such a condition sexually naive men. What about naive? A naive by referring to the Oxford Learner uh, Oxford Learners Dictionaries, it's not having enough knowledge or good judgment or experience of life. In our situation, we are talking about sexual knowledge and sexual experiences. Uh, this is the problem number one. Uh, our patients uh, have uh, low knowledge or low information, a low level of sexual information or uh, bad judgment. Uh, or uh, no sexual experience or um, something like that. What about single? Single, it's a person who is not in or a romantic relationship with somebody. So this is the problem. By referring the to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the PEPS edition for defining the erectile dysfunction, we have uh, multiple problems in the definition. Uh, number one, uh, there is no sexual activity 
there is no regular sexual activity and there is no uh, relationship distrust because we have no relationship yet for such patients. Also in diagnostic features, it should be repeated and uh, it should be affecting uh, during the part sexual activity and causing significant uh, and having significant duration of time. So we cannot apply the diagnosis or definition of erectile dysfunction for such patients. What about literature review in such a condition? By digging deep in the internet, uh, I only found two papers uh, discussing a um, condition like what we are talking about today. The first one uh, published in 1979, underlying uh, group treatment of single males with erectile dysfunction. However, in this paper, they only included six patients. Three of them uh, were previously the, um, the, they talked about the group therapy or group sexual therapy for such patients. The other paper, the other paper uh, published in 1981 in Archive Sexual Behavior uh, under the name of Group Treatment of Erectile Dysfunction uh, for Men Without Partners, a controlled evaluation. They also um, um, described the effect of group treatment for such patients. However, they only enrolled 21 patients. 12 of them uh, was uh, were previously married more than uh, at least uh, for once. And the other uh, sexual relations for a while. So they are not talking about our type of patients today. We are talking about it today. But in our, but there is no uh, papers talking about this uh, problem in the modern uh, modern literature review. There is no studies aimed to evaluate such a problem, and this may be due to lack of information uh, and the clear definition of the type of patients we are talking about. As most of studies are talking about erectile dysfunction in patients who uh, uh, either married or previously married with sexual relations and having erectile dysfunction. And lack of information about the prevalence of such a problem. And this is the problem we are uh, facing in our societies. Because uh, we in our societies, most of males um, don't have uh, uh, sexual relation before marriage. This is number one. Number two, um, um, the age of marriage may be delayed in such societies. And this, is, uh, and this may be the uh, etiology of um, etiology of this condition from the expert point of view it's not an uncommon problem as uh, described by professor amr uh, in the introduction of this uh, topic it's not uh, those patients um, every week in our clinics young male complaining of erectile dysfunction and he's not married and he's not previously married or in a, a stable sexual relation the main complaints of the patients are worry about erectile dysfunction. More, most of them worry to uh, uh, there is performance and anxiety. They are worried to fail during uh, erectile dysfunction. Most of them coming just before marriage. Uh, also, there is lack of self confidence or failed sporadic sexual trials. Most of patients either have no sexual knowledge or false or inaccurate information, and this is the problem here. How we could manage such a case management? Firstly, the definition, definitely there is no clear guideline for management of such a condition. All recommendations are based on expert opinion and experiences. And from this point of view, what is what, what can we do for such patients? Number one, we should search for any possible cause of organic erectile dysfunction if present, such as diabetes mellitus, hypertension, psychological disorders, uh, that might be the cause of real erectile dysfunction, as much, most of patients either uh, having performance in anxiety or failure of fail uh, or psychological, psychogenic erectile dysfunction. The number one, we have to take sexually carefully. We have to stress about the morning erection. What about masturbation sexual uh, trials? What about the results? Um, 
Finally, uh, we have to revise a sexual knowledge with, of, with the patients. Most of them have uh, misinformation about the duration of intercourse, benign size, uh, the rigidity of erection. So the information is the golden standard treatment for such patients. Once they have a good information about the uh, about the, what is the normal erection is, uh, how uh, how we can obtain erection, that will be sufficient in many patients of them. A few patients didn't convinced by uh, a discussion with them or uh, identifying that they are not they, are, they don't have a real erectile dysfunction. And in such patients, I recommend investigation can be done like benign duplex. In this condition, a uh, patient will see a good erection and uh, having a report telling him that he is normal, he has normal peak systolic velocity, normal arterial flow to the penis, normal penis drainage of the penis, normal erection. So he can see that he have a good erection and he will perform well when he is the situation. However, this recommendation is not without number one. We have to be carefully uh, treating with such patient because of privacy. In, uh, in this condition, we are dealing mostly with a patient who is completely normal. Uh, so we have to strict to uh, uh, guidelines for penile duplex, such as we have to uh, give him uh, prostaglandin instead of other uh, other drugs that uh, might increase the incidence of privacy. This is number one. Number two, we have to instruct the patient that he should be calm uh, without an anxiety during the uh, performing the test, not to affect him the results. Uh, number three, it should be done with a doctor in uh, not wrongly uh, interpret the results. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Islam, for this uh, nice lecture. And uh, now I'll, uh, Dr. Hayat Al Harthi will be the one moderating our next two speakers. Dr. Hayat, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Almeleji. I'm very happy to be a moderator in such an important um, webinar. I'm going to introduce, it, it's given me a pleasure to introduce Dr. Abdulaziz Ba'adi. He is the Assistant Professor of Urology at Umm al, uh, um al Qura University in Saudi Arabia. He is a member of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and the International Society for Sexual Medicine. He was the past uh, president of Middle East Society of Sexual Medicine. He is a reviewer in several medical journals and he has more than 20 uh, publications. Among the most controversial topics that we have in our Middle East is the sex and sexuality. Dr. Ba'adib is going to talk about the topic challenges and factors contributing to the difficulties in practice faced by the sexual medicine um, physician in our Middle East, Dr. Ba'adi. Thank you for, very much, Dr. Hayat, and uh, it's an honor to be with you this evening. Uh, as the do Dr. Vasan mentioned, there are uh, huge similarities between our cultures in the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent. So although I'm from the Middle East and I practice here, uh, you'll find that uh, there are many things that I uh, touch upon that you uh, have similarities with the Indian subcontinent. So uh, when we talk about a culture, we're talking about the common and accepted way of thinking, feeling, and uh, acting uh, for a uh, group of individuals uh, or people. Uh, as a person who practices sexual medicine, it's important for us to realize that each region has its own set of uh, rules, norms, beliefs, and uh, traditions. Uh, we often hear that in the Middle East, sex is a taboo topic that is frowned upon and is not discussed. And I find this uh, far from reality. Everybody talks about sex. Uh, it, the, when it comes to sexual medicine, what's important is, or sexual dysfunction, what's important is who are they talking to? 
uh, are they talking to a sexual medicine specialist or their friends? Uh, there is some uh, truth to that phrase, and it comes from the concept of sitter or uh, observing modesty. And that's keeping uh, private things ma uh, ma uh, private when it comes to sexuality. However, uh, the actual practice of sex within the couple uh, in a marriage relationship is something that is viewed as positive. Intimacy, foreplay, even sexual intercourse with one's uh, spouse are things that are encouraged and uh, religiously are rewarded by God. Uh, so as individuals who practice sexual medicine, uh, we have been trained, prob probably everyone who is in attendance has been trained in uh, conventional medicine. Uh, and this is based on uh, books that are uh, written in English, uh, and this is our training. However, we practice in a civilization that is different from this Western civilization. And these are some of the basic differences. Uh, as an example, in Western civilization, the uh, focal point is the individual and individual freedom. Uh, whereas in the Middle East, uh, in our region, uh, family is the focal point. People live with uh, their families until they are ready to get married and form a family of their own. We have a, a very high patriarchal structure where uh, the father is the breadwinner and the provider for the members of his family. And this uh, impacts uh, the strong sense of hierarchy in our community. Uh, obviously, premarital as, uh, and extramarital sex, as has been previously mentioned several times today, are usually forbidden. Uh, and individuals who practice in premarital or extramarital sex uh, can, uh, have, uh, can suffer negative consequences. And in many regions, even any form of interaction between unmarried men and women is frowned upon. Also, our attitude towards uh, health and illness are different from the West. Uh, here, uh, illness is often viewed as part of God's general plan, and he is asked uh, to aid in lifting it. And uh, sometimes people look at it as a test from God. Uh, so uh, when we talk about factors that uh, make it challenging to practice uh, sexual medicine in our region, we can talk about societal and environmental factors, physician-related factors, and patient-related factors. We'll start by the first one. Um, and one of these factors is the supernatural or the belief in the supernatural. We believe in something called the evil eye or envy, uh, what is locally uh, called hasad. And these are negative events uh, that can befall a person as a result of someone's feeling of jealousy towards them. Uh, black magic is another phenomenon uh, where people seek the services of someone who practices sorcery to inflict harm, either physical or emotional, onto others. And uh, these phenomena uh, are uh, both mentioned in the Quran and many uh, Christians and Jews in the, region, in the region also believe in them. This makes these supernatural phenomena uh, uh, potential causes for illness in the eyes of both patients and physicians, uh, especially uh, when a patient feels that the complaint seems difficult to diagnose or is resistant to treatment then uh, they refer to back to these phenomena as a source of their troubles rather than something that can be diagnosed with uh, conventional medicine. They don't have a place in conventional medicine, uh, but it's difficult for us to dismiss them because they're an inherent part of the belief of both the patient and the physician. Uh, not all is negative when it comes to the supernatural or the religious uh, aspect. In some instances, religious counseling might prove uh, a potentially useful tool for physicians. Another factor is family involvement. As I mentioned earlier, family is extremely important in our uh, culture and in our region. Uh, and when it comes to other disciplines, for example, in oncology, uh, the family can serve as an important resource for uh, the patients to rely on uh, for support uh, during times of illness. Unfortunately, when it comes to sexual dysfunction, uh, because patients are either embarrassed or ashamed. Uh, they often uh, don't have this option to share their sexual dysfunction with their family. And that might lead to individuals who suffer from sexual dysfunction to feel further isolated. Uh, sometimes uh, families in the Middle East can be perceived as demanding. Uh, 
Uh, and, but it's important for us to understand that culturally, this is their way of exhibiting that they care about the patient and they want what's uh, best for them. And they want to make sure that the patient, their relative, is receiving the best possible care. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when the family are involved uh, in a couple that suffer sexual dysfunction, it's often uh, a, a bad sign. It uh, often uh, uh, heralds a deterioration in the relationship. In the relationship, uh, very often, when the family becomes involved, the couple the couple are already uh, separated from each other, and the involvement of the sexual medicine specialist. Uh, is viewed as a last-ditch effort to save this relationship. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, the uh, family members can be uh, disruptive to the interview process, uh, and they might uh, take a defensive stance where they look at the issue as our son versus your daughter or vice versa, uh, instead of trying to actually solve the problem as a couple. Uh, in, in data that you widely uh, or largely from other disciplines, uh, it has been documented that some Middle Eastern families can be perceived as an impediment to patients' participation in their care. Uh, some family members might act that they uh, know what is best for the patient or the couple. Uh, they might request concealment of information from the patient. Uh, they might answer on the patient's behalf, and they might interfere with treatment choices. Uh, furthermore, even after the issue is uh, resolved, and uh, for example, the, the patient, the couple had unconsummated marriage, and the marriage has been consummated, and the couple moved on. Unfortunately, the involvement of the families before the issue was addressed might carry social dimensions afterwards, uh, such as shaming, for example. Whenever there is an issue or a problem that arises between the couple later on, they might refer or revert back to that issue and shame the partner uh, about uh, how they had this issue. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the communication issues might not just, uh, might not just involve the families, but uh, might extend to between the actual partners. Uh, very often, the sexual medicine specialist is faced by only one partner presenting. Uh, and when this happens, they usually provide a unilateral perspective uh, which, as we know, in uh, sex, where two uh, partners are invo involved usually, uh, that might not be accurate. Uh, and uh, when asked or encouraged, frequently uh, this uh, one partner resists involving the spouse. As an example, in one study that uh, involved unconsummated marriage, only half of the, uh, the, uh, the people who uh, presented uh, was by agreement of both partners. Unfortunately, we as physicians might uh, be part of the problem. Uh, in the Middle East, we have this uh, very basic problem of who, man who manages uh, sexual dysfunction. Uh, very often, uh, sexual medicine is not uh, considered a separate discipline. It is covered by uh, many uh, specialties. Uh, as we noticed today uh, as well, uh, we have speakers from uh, different uh, disciplines uh, addressing sexual medicine. Now, it's uh, very well and good if the uh, individuals are trained, but unfortunately, some doctors promote themselves as uh, specialists in sexual medicine without proficiency or even adequate training. And this conduct is detrimental both to the patient's care and to the discipline of sexual medicine. Uh, here in our region, family medicine is unfortunately not properly established, so uh, patients are not usually referred by their primary provider uh, but uh, they are left to fend for themselves and look for the right doctor, uh, which uh, might lead to suboptimal care. Uh, unfortunately, uh, education and training are lacking when it comes to sexual medicine. Ex exposure in medical school is deficient uh, when it comes to sexual medicine. Uh, we as faculty often overlook uh, sexual medicine ed education, and unfortunately, society sometimes might find it inappropriate to teach sexual medicine. I've had some of my female students leave the room when I uh, talk about erectile dysfunction as an example. Uh, we can sometimes uh, participate in uh, some of the problematic uh, practices. As an example, uh, one of the following uh, talks will cover female genital cutting. 
There's something in our region called virginity testing that uh, aims at establishing if a uh, lady is uh, indeed uh, intact or a virgin. Uh, and uh, these might be practiced by uh, physicians. And uh, as we know, some of these practices, such as female genital cutting, might negatively impact a person's uh, sexual or even physical health. Uh, and sometimes we uh, use conventional medicine to modify these practices, for example, uh, performing female genital cutting under general anesthesia. And uh, very often, unfortunately, uh, these acts are performed against uh, the patient's will because their family uh, requires it. And uh, people who do practice this have, you know, uh, have an argument why they do it. Uh, they say that it's safer for the, if the patient has it done by someone who has medical training rather than go uh, to a folk medicine uh, practitioner. Uh, so th this is a huge argument and debate, but um, at least uh, I'm putting it out there. Then we have uh, patient-related factors. Um, Middle Easterners, unfortunately, have notoriously and very often unrealistically high expectations when it comes to uh, life in general and medicine, uh, sexual medicine to be particular. Uh, we've heard uh, some of the studies involving uh, the penile size and some of the larger studies uh, that uh, involve men who believe they have a small penis come from the Middle East. And uh, in some studies that involve uh, penile prosthesis insertion, uh, the patient and the partner's satisfaction following this procedure, which is a very good procedure, uh, are not as high as reported in elsewhere in the world. Uh, compliance is another patient-related factor. Uh, one is compliance with appointments, punctuality and adherence to time carry less importance in our region. Uh, it's uh, not surprising at all if patients uh, arrive late for their appointments, and this has a negative impact on the physician's practice uh, where there are generally high no-show rates, and the strategies that are implied, uh, applied by physicians or by hospitals to cope with this high no-show rate, such as uh, accepting walk-in patients, might not be the best when it comes to practicing sexual medicine. Also, compliance with uh, medications or treatment in general can be challenging. Uh, discontinuation rates are high. These, uh, when given by patients, uh, causes uh, can include actual side effects from the medications or fear that they might be harmful. Uh, sometimes they perceive that they, there might be lack of benefit from the treatment, or they might be worried that they will become dependent on the medication. And some of these patients simply uh, believe in alternative or folk medicine. Unfortunately, there is some uh, degree of lack of trust when it comes to uh, medicine, the conventional medicine. Uh, Middle Easterners often look for the best person in the field, and this can lead to indecisiveness and delays in management uh, and frust frustration both to patients and to physicians. What can happen is if they seek a second opinion and they find that there's a difference in approach uh, between two physicians, then they automatically think that one of these two doctors is wrong and they seek a third opinion and so on and so forth. And eventually, this can lead to patients withholding information from the uh, previous visits uh, when they're dealing with uh, the current doctor in order to test the uh, current physician if they will uh, reach the same conclusion as the others or not. So it can be very frustrating. Uh, and, it, and at least one study, uh, most patients in that study placed uh, greater trust in non-Arabic-speaking physicians. Maybe it's something, it has something to do with uh, blonde hair and blue eyes that makes you more uh, trustworthy. Uh, we're put in a very challenging situation when we are uh, caught in the middle of legal battles, unfortunately. In this situation, uh, the physicians, can, sorry, the patients can be using the physician for gain. And as we know, in, when it comes to sexual medicine, we know that we can help a couple. Unfortunately, uh, when it comes to a legal battle, neither of the partners wants uh, help or is seeking help. They are seeking to prove that the issue is either uh, with, the, with their partner, either that they are, for example, uh, suffering from erectile dysfunction or that she has vaginismus. So they want to pr prove that the other party is inadequate, so to speak. And in this situation, it might be challenging for the, uh, the uh, sexual medicine specialist to actually prove who has the, uh, the uh, pathology 
for lack of a better word. Uh, use of counterfeit medications and alternative medicine is uh, huge in uh, our region. Uh, many people in our region are averse to modern medicine. This is because they use herbal remedies or certain foods, or they go to a religious healer or seek the traditional uh, Arabic medicine or a combination of these. Uh, and unfortunately, these substances sometimes can be harmful. In one study from here from Saudi Arabia, more than a third of these uh, substances uh, carry uh, potentially harmful content. Uh, as we know, uh, psychogenic factors can strongly affect social sexual function. Uh, and in our culture, emotional well-being is very important. It is a sign of good health in general, or looked at as a sign of good health. And there's a common belief that becoming deeply upset might cause physical illness. And in many patients, when they have a sexual dysfunction, they'll express that their condition has psychologically affected them, meaning that it has negatively impacted their life and emotionally drained them. Uh, and uh, despite all of this, Middle Eastern patients can be very reluctant, unfortunately, to see psychiatrists, which can, which can be a, a, quite a challenge. Uh, another issue of communication is withholding information. Sometimes uh, questions that can be perceived by the patient as delicate, for example, asking about extramarital relationships or masturbation, are often difficult to answer. They're likened to confessing uh, to committing a sin. Uh, another issue is having companions. Uh, some It's very common for patients to arrive with a parent or a sibling or even a friend. And they might be too embarrassed to ask for them to remain in the waiting room and their presence in the interview room, likely to withholding information. Uh, sometimes the, this companion can be offended if they're asked to leave the room. And in some instances, the patient asks for them to stay in the room, but then conceals information because they're here. Uh, to conclude, cultures are fluid in nature. Not all members of a society share all the same values and patterns of behavior. We would be wise to avoid general assumptions uh, because these can uh, lead to negative uh, stigma, stigmata, uh, and we should individualize care. Uh, care. Uh, understanding a culture provides a reason for why people behave the, the way they do as opposed to how they will behave. We should avoid stereotypes. And we should reflect on our own culture. We have been trained to uh, practice uh, conventional medicine where the in interests and well-being of the patients take priority. However, we need to prioritize this as defined by the patient, what is their best interest and in what is what they define as their well-being. Well uh, it's beneficial to avoid negative remarks about the patient's culture and background and in to encourage them to share with us the cultural aspects that might influence their decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ba'adim, for such interesting, detailed uh, challenges and, contrib um, I mean, uh, factors, really, we are facing. Even I'm not a psychologist, uh, and I'm, I'm interested in the sexual medicine, but I face it in my daily work. Thank you very much. Uh, now, it gives me the pleasure of uh, introducing the last speaker. And I'm really happy to present one of the most active and pleasant psychosexual therapist, relationship counselor, Dr. Wafa Atantawi. Dr. Wafa is a general medical counselor, licensed gynecologist, and a professional member of the International Society of Sexual Medicine, the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy, and the Middle East Society of Sexual Medicine. Her areas of expertise include relationship and communication problems, loss of desire and orgasmic problem. She will be talking about, to us about a very important uh, topic which can cause orgasmic dysfunction in the woman, which is the female genital utilization, where we stand. Dr. Wafa. Hi. Um, thank you, Dr. Hayat. I think I have a problem with sharing. Let me stop sharing because I think the presentation just went... Um, so, um, an advance. Th thank you very much for inviting me to. Um, I don't know how to go back. Sorry for that. Okay. Um, all right. Um, 
I'm really sorry. Can you share my presentation from your side? Because I'm, I'm really having problems here. Can anyone help me? Can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear me? 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 Hi, thank you very much for inviting. Can you hear me, please? Hello? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Dr. You can hear? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, today to present uh, about FGM and... Uh, you muted. Oh, I can go back. Oh my God, sorry. Okay, let me just do something here. I have been ready for a long time and now problems have happened, okay. I'm really sorry, it's, it's just, you can't hear me, yeah? I can hear you very well, Dr. Rofa. Um, why they are saying they can't hear me? No, no, we, we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me go back then, sorry. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me today to be one of the speakers in your, um, in your webinar uh, is the first webinar uh, joint between uh, um, between Asian Society of Sexual Medicine and Middle East Society of Sexual Medicine. And you can see from my title, I'm gonna talk about female genital mutilation and um, its impact on orgasmic uh, function for the woman. Um, my objective today is I'm going to touch on a female genital mutilation and I'm going to, it's complication, orgasm and orgasmic dysfunction, impact of FGM on female sexual functions and FGM as a component of multifactorial sexual dysfunction. Um, FGM as WHO um, define it is comprises all um, procedures that involve partial or total removal of external female genital organs and only for cultural, religious or non-therapeutic reasons. We know that FGM is not done ever for any therapeutic region and it's very common in uh, most countries in Africa and Middle East and also Asia. It's it estimated by WHO that around 200 million women and girls have undergone FGM until now and around 3 million are waiting to be cut. And again, it's the major public health problem, especially in developing countries and research shows that it has a numerous psychophysiological consequences and it's only culturally determined. And for example, um, in some countries, in, in, in some countries, they, people can't have um, can't marry without having female circumcision. And it's considered as it's a promoter for marriageability and safeguarding of virginity in some countries. In, in Somaliland, it is considered that women have to have the skeletal cut because um, it's, it's, it's similar to male penis. So it has to be cut to be female. And it's actually in some, in some, other culture, it is a social accepting thing. Um, quickly, uh, quickly, I'm going to take you to the types of FGM because maybe it's, um, it's, it's again, we need to know why, um, what happened when people have FGM. So removal of the clitoris is believed to decrease or eliminate sexual pleasure, arousal and orgasm. Hi, hello? Oh, you are changing for me. 
I thought, okay, can, I think I can do it from my side. Okay. All right. So I leave it for you then. If something wrong can happen from my side. Okay. So it's a slide about types of FGM now. So there are four types of FGM, but I'm going to only talk about three today, which is a type one. Type one is just part or um, the whole clitoris with the hood is removed. So part two is part or the whole clitoris and the hood and the libia minora are removed on part three is the hood and the clitoris and the libia minora and libia majora are removed. And there is another version of uh, number three is where everything is removed and then the vulva has been sealed completely and only leaving a tiny, a tiny um, opening here to pass urine and blood. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello? Can, can you share the next slide, please? Yeah. Complication of FGM, at least to serious short and long-term health problems. Um, lo short-term problems, we know it could be shock, bleeding, infection, severe pain, and sepsis, but long-term problems can be many. And one of them, which is related to our presentation today, is sexual dysfunction. We know also that it has psychological impact and like low self-esteem, disturbed self-identity and anxiety panic, and also post-traumatic stress disorder. It was found that one in, one in six women who have undergone female genital mutilation suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. And in one of the study um, paper written by Dr. Soher, uh, in Neil, in 2016, she is a psych she is a Sudanese doctor, works in UK as urogynecologist, <laughs> and she found that the prevalence of female sexual dysfunction after FGM <laughs> estimated to be 25 to 63 percent, depending on the uh, individual uh, studied and the definitions they use. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Hello? No, they have changed, madam, slide. The clitoris slide is there. Okay. We can't talk about FGM without talking about the clitoris. And actually, the clitoris is the most important part in women's body. It is the most, it is the erotic organ of the um, of the sexual uh, function in women. So if we talk about the clitoris, it is a multi-planar erectile organ located medial and inferior to the pubic arch and senses. It also has internal and external structure. It is thought that um, clitoris is completely removed during, during circumcision. However, what we normally is removed is the glands as, we, as, as I showed you in the previous slide that um, the glands is removed, labia minora is removed, but the clitoris has deeper, has deeper structure than this. So it consists of glands, and the glands is the mo most visible part of the clitoris we see when we examine women. It has a booty which is attached to the pubic senses by suspensory ligament. It has a crora, and it has also the bulbs, and the bulbs are the two erectile structures which are similar to male penis. And there is also a lot, there is elements, um, neurovascular supply, and the, these elements and neurovascular supply are crucial to its role in the female sexual function. Next one, please. This is a picture to just show you the clitoris, and um, as you can see here, this is the clitoris, and this is the body of the clitoris here, this is the hood and the body, and this is one of the crura we talked about before, and this is the main bulb on one of each side, which is engorged and get erected during sex. And this is a, a nice picture I came across while I was preparing this presentation, it's a side view of the clitoris, and you can see here, this is when we are, when the, there is no arousal, and it's in the resting position, you can see 
these are glands and the hood and the uh, pulp here. But when the woman is aroused, you can see there is engorgement of blood and erection in the pulp and increasing the size of the whole clitoris. Next one, please. So female orgasmic disorder, as we all know, it's a difficulty or an ability of a woman to reach orgasm and with sufficient sexual stimulation. It can co it, it, it must cause sexual um, um, frustration and market distress and interpersonal difficulties. As we know, it might be primary or secondary. Primary woman never had orgasm, secondary orgasm in the past, but never again. Sometimes one can get orgasm in certain situations, not in the others, and sometimes she can get at all. And this is just a, a, um, a slide to show the sexual response cycle, which is a bit like complex because sexual response cycle, it has certain stage like excitement, plateau, orgasm, and then resolution. But it is controlled by hormones, by nervous system, uh, by the anatomy of the clitoris. Um, there is Different, uh, different reasons for orgasmic disorder, and you can, you can really list many of them, as my colleagues mentioned before, that it's lack of knowledge about sex, one of them, and um, stress and, and psychological disturbance like depression and, and um, also medication, some, some medical, some health conditions and hormonal, and the most important, also any surgery happened to um, uh, gynecological surgery and FGM and the post-traumatic sexual experience also of, of FGM. Um, FGM can affect female sexuality, however, only few studies, when I was searching, and only few studies are available and actually they have significant methodological limitation. Some studies have adopted validated questionnaire to analyze female function, some adopted validated female sexual function index. And the majority of the studies show that there is definitely negative impact on female genital mutilation, on um, negative impact of female genital mutilation on women's sexual health. I'm gonna just go through uh, some of the studies I came across and most of the studies you will find them coming from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, from Iran, uh, one from France and um, uh, from the Middle East. And in this Saudi um, case control study, they found that all the participants in the FGM group, they showed lower FSFI, full skills, and also significantly, sig statistically significant lower arousal, lubrication, orgasm, and um, satisfaction. Again, Dr. Anis from Egypt, he also showed the similar results. And this, this is a literature review where this, um, Beatrice and Ital just checked the PubMed and they found seven studies, three included in control groups, showed decreased orgasmic functions in female genital mutilation. Again, they couldn't comment on, on that because there was like, um, a lot of demographic differences, and also there was uh, no comment on clitoral integrity after female sexual, um, uh, after FGM. Again, another study from Egypt, they found that 60% of, of mutilated women who had sexual dysfunction was purely related to circumcision. And again, another, another study from Egypt, it, this again showed that desire, arousal, lubrication, orgasm, and satisfaction were significantly poorer with type 2 FGM. Another study from Iran showed similar results. This study was done in France and they were... Com Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. And this is another study from France, and uh, um, it, it, also, it, it was checking the um, all sexual function and domains in, in female sexual function index before surgery and after surgery. And they noticed that before surgery that all domains of the female sexual function index are affected. Um, again, another study from Egypt in 2017 Show significantly lower full scale again of um, female sexual function index into the FGM group. All demands were again significantly lower. Uh, in, 
and the female sexual function index, we look at different domains, which is the interest, arousal, lubrication, orgasm, and satisfaction and pain. This is another uh, study from Iran, which again showed similar results. This is a, a very interesting study I came across, and um, it's done by Dr. Um, by Abdel Qadir, and it was published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine in 2016. And this study where we wanted to study the impact of FGM on the anatomy of the clitoris and bulbs using MRI. And also they want to check the sexual function using psychometric instruments like, um, like sexual desire inventory disorder uh, questionnaire and also female sexual function index. And the, the other aim was wants to, to investigate, is there any difference in anatomy uh, after FGM uh, of the FGM woman? And if this is correlated to the difference in sexual function. And actually, they recruited 15 cut women and 15 uncut women. FGM women didn't have significantly decreased clitoral glands, which was a bit surprising, with and body. So the, 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 the glands itself, it has in, no impact on it, but significantly smaller volume of clitoral bulb. Again, they didn't mention if what type of what type of female genital mutilation was performed on this woman, and they didn't um, correlate with, uh, uh, as I said before, the collateral integrity. And FGM women scored significantly lower on sexual function and desire on sexual desire inventory inventory than non FGM. However, which was interesting part that they didn't score lower on female sexual function index sub scores for orgasm, desire, and satisfaction, but report significantly more dyspareunia. The conclusion it says that maybe the FGM women have sexual erectile tissues, which enough maybe for sexual arousal, orgasm, and pleasure. This was a small study, and it's it's like a, the beginning, and I think it. It's again um, tells us it's a good idea to look at the clitoris again of FGM people. Again, um, we know that the damaging impact of FGM um, is known, but it's rarely broken down according to the type of GM procedure and the existence of a dose response relationship. This means the type of um, and FGM performed and the impact on sexual function. Well, I haven't studied. I haven't found many studies relating the type of FGM to the se sexual function. However, few I came across is Anderson here found that type three FGM is associated with lower sexual function as compared to control. Again, another Egypt um, sorry study from Egypt found significantly worse sexual function in women with type two compared to type one and without FGM. Again, another study demonstrated women with type 3 FGM presented worst FSFI. I think we need more research to um, look at the relationship between um, FGM and sexual dysfunction. So in summary, recognizing that FGM is only one of many cultural specific ways in which woman body and sexual integrity is abused, sometimes with their participation because it, they fit into their community. They need to be part of the community. And in some tribes in Africa, if the woman is not circumcised, she can marry and she will feel completely isolated. FGM is a major cause of sexual dysfunction. Orgasmic disorder is one of them. Not enough studies were done to measure the impact of FGM on orgasm alone, and not enough studies were done to measure the impact of each type of FGM on sexual function. And orgasmic, when we look at orgasmic dysfunction, we can't look only at anatomical level. Orgasmic dysfunction is a multifactorial disorder, and it has to be tackled individually in a holistic way, particularly in the presence of FGM. I notice here, for example, in UK, they talk a lot about female cutting and female genital mutilation. They passed a lot of law about it. And, and actually, they don't still understand the culture behind that. And if you see a patient with FGM in your clinic, how you can address this part, um, culture part, with, 
in, in your uh, plan for treatment. FGM women have specific anatomical and sociocultural issues, and they are more likely to have had other traumatic experiences. Again, maybe they have exposed to forced marriage or rape. And when we, when we talk about human sexuality, we need to take into consideration like it's, it's an interaction of multiple factors. It's, not, it's anatomical, it's neurological, it's emotional, it's physiological and biochemical mechanism. Thank you. Sorry for the um, rocky start. Thank you very much, Dr. Rafa. It was interesting in spite of all the difficulties we faced. I am really sorry. I don't know how to come back to you now. We, we enjoyed it. Uh, I think we don't need more researchers. We need to stop having the female genital mutilation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wafa. Thank you. If, if there are, uh, Dr. Hayat, thank you for moderating the session. If there are questions, it's time to take the questions now. Dr. Natesh. Dr. Natesh, are you there? Hello? Dr. Natesh, are you there? Yeah. There were certain questions which were asked earlier. I shall read it out, let the panel answer. Should be the management strategy of that syndrome. I think uh, Dr. Bishurul Hafi has comprehensively covered uh, that syndrome. If he wants to repeat the same, uh, Dr. Hafi, are you there? Dr. Hafi, are you there? Uh, hello, yes, 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 just one minute. Oh, yeah, please. You have already covered uh, it, but uh, if you can uh, just, you know, cover it in a nutshell, please. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you, uh, we, uh, we, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the question is about uh, management of that syndrome, right? Yeah, management strategy, strategy. Okay. okay. Uh, actually, first we have to, um, you know, assess the uh, the individual very, uh, you know, uh, elaborately because uh, People will have different concept of what is uh, 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 what is that and what is uh, what is the uh, you know uh, some people may tell like uh, something is going after maturation or some some people may uh, you know tell like you know masturbation is the cause of the syndrome or something like that. So we have to assess uh, what exactly is meant by that and what 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 is what are his or his symptoms and after this assessment we have to uh, uh, you know uh, like uh, we have to uh, 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 think i mean ask him like what is his expectation from it like some people may actually want something uh, you know yes can, can i interfere yes yes so what in a nutshell what is the best management strategy you mean to say? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that, that's what I'm, I'm going to tell. Like, you know, uh, first, uh, like, you know, if, if they uh, actually want some neutral or something like that, we can actually give some placebo. But, you know, actual treatment uh, is uh, mainstream treatment is non-pharmacological treatment, which, which will be like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy with, uh, you know, some guided uh, uh, masturbatory exercises and uh, proper sex education is having some uh, myths about uh, uh, human sexuality that we have to correct them and if uh, they he he has some comorbid depression or anxiety then we will have to give a pick so basically cbt uh, with uh, sex education and plus or minus uh, uh, that is the uh, treatment dr vineet oh. dr vineet uh, uh, is there any role of an alpha blocker in the management of the thought syndrome? Even Dr. Hafi can answer this. Is there any role of alpha blocker? Yeah. So 
so that syndrome is actually very very difficult to manage and i think we've had a very good discussion by dr ravi about it and uh, as a urologist you know i always look more at how i can manage with uh, therapeutic uh, intervention uh, since i am, i would not be appropriate to impart so much of psycho uh, therapy and and i look at uh, symptoms and and management of the symptoms and most of these men will come with excessive emissions and and wherever the excessive emission is associated purely only as excessive emission i will look as alpha blocker as the appropriate line of treatment if it is associated with any sexual dysfunction a lot of these men have both of these factors which means they will either have erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation so it's about boosting confidence and giving a low dose tadalafil along with an alpha blocker or just a low dose tadalafil which also has uh, a minor alpha blocking ability sometimes works very well in these men thank you vinith so how the next question is about ed what is the role of uh, prp in ed treatment vinith difficult for me to answer since i don't use it uh, see for me uh, everything uh, especially in my practice i i i like to be completely evidence based uh, because of which i do not currently use uh, prp for erectile dysfunction but i would be happy to listen to uh, what the opinion of the house is in terms of using uh, prp for erectile dysfunction yeah i agree with you totally uh, dr fensen i mean this is still experimental and in uh, universities it's not uh, until now uh, evidence based medicine a uh, few use it uh, but this is all uh, isolated cases uh, I agree totally that it should not be a daily practice or until it is on clinical trial and an evidence based uh, treatment. I right. agree with you. Thank you. See there is a another question by an andra andrologist. We are well aware of the stigma around sexual health and infertility. Many men and women suffer in silence and are reluctant to seek medical help as a result of embarrassment and stigma around so what can we as professionals do encourage men and women to come forward and seek help at an earlier stage you know this is a question for all the panelists um i think um as health professional we need to be able to speak about sex in any circumstances and as dr um dr basim uh, abdul aziz just pointed out that it's difficult sometimes to ask the sexual question questions i think some of the clinician or some of his trainees go out of the room because they don't want to listen to such embarrassing question i think it's it's all about the clinician getting more confidence in asking the question opening the topic in a, in a very a um, natural way so the the client or the patient won't feel like they are really embarrassed and this is needs a lot of education and teaching and training for health professional i believe bazim yeah i i think uh, that's an excellent question and this is the perfect opportunity to discuss it i think it's uh, uh, it's more than any one individual uh one any one individual's effort uh this is a perfect example where society or societies such as the sasam and mes system can help uh the uh, solution is to educate people uh the earlier they present and seek medical advice the earlier that we can help them uh so i think that's a, a very important message and a very important role for these uh, our societies to fill there's a big void and uh, we need to fill it thank you yeah yeah i think dr amar agrees uh, with us that we discussed the same in issm subcommittee on uh, this uh, developing countries as well the same yeah, if, if i want to add something please uh, please uh, yeah. dr bahar as we see from all uh, our lectures today uh, our main problem is the lack of information okay if we're speaking about the girth and the size of the penis the masturbatory guilt the fgm the unconsummated marriage so i wonder if 
uh, I mean, we are from very different countries, maybe 10 or more countries having the same problems. I wonder if anybody is having in his own country any kind of a program which is put right now and it's successful so that we can share it together or think or brainstorm together in order to promote, uh, uh, I mean, uh, proper sexual education. Our society is trying to help. Your society is trying to help. It seems this is not enough, but I mean, it needs something which pushes governments, okay, to be involved in such a thing, whether through schools with sex education, through the media, through Ministry of Health. So uh, can anybody share if he has in his own country a kind of a program uh, uh, promoting uh, that? Or? Amir, actually what, what we did is actually about uh, in 2013, we started in, uh, in India, government of Karnataka, we started as an AIDS, uh, you know, uh, in AIDS prevention program, we started this as a part of uh, know your body, know your mind. You know, I spoke to, spoke about this uh, even in that subcommittee meeting. You know, we started that program, but however, you know that this as a society, we are too conservative and our government itself dropped the idea after three, four years. So it went back. So we have to start again as the question is so comprehensive and the answer will be you know, too comprehensive too. If anybody wants to add any more, Please. What I would like to say is, you know, we have to start small. And uh, I, I, I thought this was a really, really difficult question to answer. So, so about five years back, I set up this men's health clinic in New Delhi. And initially, there used to be a lot of reluctance for men to come forward to a clinic which was identified as something dealing with sexual and reproductive health. You know, it's not easy for men to accept that that they can walk into a clinic which essentially deals only with that. So, so there is there is a there is a circumscript feeling about it. People are not comfortable. But I found people with their mentality changing, and 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 I think we need to take small brave steps towards this direction. And 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 people are far more intelligent. They are far more this thing than we give them credit for. They are coming forward. And, and maybe it is all of us uh, in our efforts that we will make. We will, we will bring about a slow change. I don't think I see it happening, uh, you know, fast. I don't see it happening overnight. But I think it is these uh, little steps that all of us will do and, and we will bring change. So I think I, I look more at us as professionals bringing about that change. Thank you. Thank you. You have summed up everything. Dr. Talal, you want to add anything? Unmute. Sir, you were to unmute. I'm, I'm waiting for permission to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I guess I again. Okay. Uh, the, the, the only issue I, I find if we don't act on a larger scale is that uh, the void will be filled by something other than a qualified society. Uh, and this is what's already happening. We, we see a lot of, unfortunately, misinformation and feeding of the myths and the misunderstanding that is out there. Uh, again, I, I find that we need to act. Uh, we as the MESSM have already established a public awareness committee. We're trying, we're doing our part. I'm sure at the SASM you're doing the same. Um, we need to do better is, is uh, what I think we needs to be done. And if, if we can work together, maybe the scale will be larger and we can try, we can, get the job done faster. Thank you. I'm sorry I was on mute. I did not, uh, uh, you did not hear my voice. I said, I cannot say more. I think it's go back again and again and again to education and patient education and uh, sexual health education. Just a small example, I tell you about how much this affects the society. I have uh, married couples for two years last week, young uh, they live somewhere in the middle of the desert and they came because of infertility. Two years, he said, normal sexual intercourse and we did all the lab tests, everything is normal and fine. And uh, I told him everything is normal. He said, it can't be. So the only question I missed, what about your intercourse? How you do it? He said, I complete my intercourse 
But at the time of ejaculation, I pull out. Why? Because he said this is something dirty I cannot put in. So you, you see how much these people are uneducated about uh, having a baby, you know? So it happened. Thank you. Absolutely, you have hit the, hit the nail on the head, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, we will be very happy to work with you, sir, uh, from Assassin. And there is one more, you know, the questions are like this, you know. This question, you know, anybody can answer, but see the question. How sex can enhance the quality of life? It's too big a question for this webinar. However, if anybody wants to <laughs> answer this in a very short time, they are, they are welcome. Uh, I, I think it's a big question for uh, it did by itself uh, uh, set up a webinar with multi expertise uh, to tackle uh, this subject. I think maybe uh, if all we are done, uh, we're running a little bit of time because I see uh, time is late and it's Friday. Yeah. So uh, if you allow us to uh, end the sessions, if there's no more questions or no more comments. Last, last one more question, sir. Last question. Can female masturbate normally? Was the question. Can female masturbate normally, Dr. <laughs> Hayat? Um, I didn't understand what, what they meant by normally. This is what is the question, but however, the, I think the, as a you know sexologist or sexual medicine consultant, there is nothing wrong in masturbation by female. You know uh, whether it is normal, abnormal. You know this normal masturbation, abnormal masturbation itself. Uh, I don't think there is any anything what is called as abnormal masturbation. What is the panel view about this? Is there anything which is abnormal? Masturbation is a masturbation. What is there is nothing abnormal about masturbation, okay? But again, we will we have to look at masturbation in the context of culture and the beliefs of the patient. Because, um, for example, part of our sex therapy, we give, we we help women and men to explore themselves, and part of that is to touch their genitals. Some people sometimes feel this is wrong because their culture and tradition and what they have been taught told them it's wrong to touch your private part. And here where it comes again, the education and information and explanation that that's okay, you can do that because it's again, it, it, you have to put it in the context of how patient sees things. So if the patient is worried about because it's a haram, sometimes they feel like it's not from religion to touch themselves. And um, for example, I have a, seen a client who think, who thought like, um, I shouldn't have oral sex. It's not in Islam. And and people have different interpretation and different understanding of what Islam is or what religion is. And also, again, they are taking culture as a strategic thing. They feel it's it's like a construct and they have to follow it. So again, it goes back to masturbation, either in male or female, is not wrong. And they can masturbate. And there is some something called self um um, pleasurizing, they can do it and we use it in sex therapy all the time to help people to be aware and get body awareness and know what pleasurizes them, what doesn't. So I think it's, it's they can. If, but again, as we said, every person is uh, or every individual is different. So we have to see the whole context of the, how the patient presented to you, what's the background, what are the beliefs, the culture and everything and try within that to um, educate and help them to overcome their sexual difficulties. Thank you. You you have given a most comprehensive answer. So, <laughs> Doctor, but can I can I just share one thought? Yeah, please, 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 please. Um, uh, actually, uh, you know, we 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 are discussing that uh, in India and in Middle East. You know, we are uh, finding resistance for sex education and all. Actually, uh, our teacher Evi Kirana from Greece, she told me one story that uh, she went to uh, take a sex education in a school and uh, instead of talking about abstinence based sex education she talked about pleasure and next day parents came to uh, school and uh, you know they had a pta meeting and uh, they told that this doctor should not enter this compound again okay so if if they are finding this much resistance 
in western countries you know uh, we we i mean as a society we have you know many years to you know move on so we have to start slowly but you know uh, in in my opinion we have to emphasize on the uh, term comprehensive sexuality education because we have to taking take uh, the science as well as culture religion everything into consideration then only we can deliver uh, you know uh, the uh, perfect uh, sex education for our society that might not be you know uh, perfect for the other society so uh, yeah i think middle east and uh, our asian uh, south asian society we can work together to make a you know uh, uh, culturally and religiously acceptable sex education that will be a great thing to do agreed dr talal you have any comments unmute no, mute is again unmute unmute can i please ah uh, uh, yeah Yeah, okay after yeah so just small comment uh, dr afa i don't i think uh, we are as doctors uh, in the in the andrology field we should not encourage and make a title of normal masturbation and abnormal masturbation because this is going to end by sexual dysfunction and we as a physician we know that there is four uh, parts in uh, treating sexual dysfunction is it organic psychogenic behavioral or spiritual now behavioral it go in uh, addiction of masturbation male or female once they get married they are addicted to masturbation we tell them that this is normal behavior but it's not normal this is my comment thank okay you. dr talal thank you i'm not saying there is normal or abnormal masturbation what i'm saying it's okay for someone to touch themselves to pleasureize themselves but when masturbation becomes compulsive this is the point and if if when masturbation becomes a replacement for sexual relationship and sexual intercourse this is a problem here so i'm talking in in just a concept that women can touch themselves it's not uh, there is no such normal as you know dr talal in in anything normal is what acceptable for the patient so we can't normalize like normal or abnormal masturbation yeah brazil i want to say something yeah one one small comment sex in sexual medicine there is nothing abnormal i mean as an encompassing statement that what i i told dr talal your comments please yeah i say my comment i think abdul aziz would like to add thank you Abdelaziz. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Milig. Also, had something to comment on. It's fascinating how these discussions, uh, you know, have a, a life of their own once they get started. I have a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, uh, when it comes to normal versus abnormal masturbation, we uh, we do mention something that is bizarre forms of masturbation when it comes to uh, the topic of delayed orgasm, uh, as, as you all know. Uh, some young men uh, we find that who engage in uh, some forms of masturbation that are not the typical uh, method uh, have issues sometimes with uh, orgasmic dysfunction or delayed orgasm, as you might know, and uh, many of you have, might have seen. Uh, so that's my first comment that sometimes, yes, masturbation might border on the abnormal. Uh, the other uh, top uh, issue or the other thing I wanted to comment on is, is uh, wording. Uh, when Dr. Wafa said it's not wrong to masturbate, uh, culturally, uh, sometimes it might not be the most accurate thing to say. Uh, what we, uh, at least in my practice, what I tell individuals as, uh, is that it is not harmful. There's no, no, no documented harm that can befall you. And uh, if, if it's someone who, uh, as an example, comes in with premature ejaculation or infertility or erectile dysfunction, who mentions they ma- used to masturbate, I, I advise them that they should not feel guilty that they did not harm themselves by their previous pra- uh, practice or their ongoing practice. Uh, but that we are speaking from a scientific standpoint, and th- this has no religious uh, ramifications. We, I, I, I am not here to comment on it from the religious st- standpoint. So uh, I w- we try to separate and make sure that they understand that we're talking specifically about physiology and uh, the medical aspect. Thank you. Yeah, uh, sure, Dr. Bazim, well taken. 
i think uh, now the time is up thanks for a wonderful discussion and i thank all the speakers i thank both the societies messm as well as sasm for a wonderful discussion on sexual medicine and social cultural influences i i think dr talal also will agree that this is very you know this is a small beginning but we will take leaps and bounds and will reach pinnacle thank you sir thank you one and all thank you very much and i thank docplexus team for a wonderful work they have coordinated very well dr madhu dr pushpendu and uh, dr natesh who has uh, supported whole heartedly for coordinating this particular program and dr vasan uh, for uh, providing me this particular opportunity to moderate this session dr shamsul had to leave anyway thank you very much so thanks one and all